when I was thinking about this particular message, I thought about different songs that had an impact on my life. I don't know about you, but I haven't been saved all my life. And when I used to patronize the clubs, it was interesting because how many of you know that sometimes one of your favorite songs would come on is all you needed to hear was a couple of notes from that song and you knew that you had to get on the dance floor. I don't know about you, but when my song would come on, oh my God, I couldn't wait to get to the dance floor because the song did something because it actually ministered into my spirit. Maybe I'm by myself in this, but I know that I had a couple of songs that really just did something to me where those songs would cause me to want to dance. The song would cause me to want to sing. The song would cause me just to forget about all the trials, tribulations, troubles, or anything else because a lot of times my God was in the song. I don't know about you guys out there, but I know songs used to minister to me when I was upset. I could put on a song. I could put on a nice hard rap song. I can put on a song that I won't name any artist names, but there was some songs that would get me amped up. It was some songs that would make me want to drink. Oh my God. There was other songs when I wanted to get in my little Luther mood. There was a song I could put on to make me mellow out. I could put on some jazz songs. Songs were important in my life because songs used to minister to my soul. Now the book of Psalms is a little bit different because these minister to your soul but we're saying it under the auspices of the almighty God. Because the book of Psalm 18 here this particular song was born it was actually written by David. And the Bible says here that this was to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of his song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So this particular song that was written by David was written after he had went through a tough situation in dealing with Saul. And for all you Bible scholars out there, Saul was a king. But Saul had an issue. He had an issue of envy against David. And how many of you know that it's one thing for your friend to be jealous against you, but it's a whole nother level when the person that's jealous against you is also a so-called man of God. Oh my God, it's one thing when people in the world are envious or jealous of you, but it's a whole nother level when that jealousy sprouts from your brother or sister in Christ. See, the reason why Saul was... <clears throat> jealous of David because the women stirred him up. The women said, well, 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 Saul, you kill your one thousands, but David slays his ten thousands. And anytime you have a comparison when somebody on the outside is comparing you to somebody that you walk closely with, that can be the breeding ground for envy. So we have in this particular song, David, and you got to keep this in mind. David was in a situation where he wrote this song, and this song was born out of the fact that he had problems with his enemy, but the Lord helped him through. So when we read this, the first sentence says here in verse number one, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. And it's interesting because David starts off saying in this particular song, Lord, I will love you. He didn't say, Lord, I love you. He said, Lord, I will love you. Will means future tense. And see, once God does something for your life, then you can really say, Lord, I will love you. And the love is born out of what God has done. Think about anything, either an inanimate object or even a person that you love. A lot of times we love based on the fact of the relationship and what that individual has done for you. Oh, God operates in agape love. That's unconditional love. But we as people sometimes don't operate in that same type of love because our love is contingent upon what that person does. So as long as you bless me, so as long as you do something nice for me, so as long as you say nice things about me, I love you. But the minute I hear that you didn't said something that's contrary to what I think you should say about me, anger sets in and then my love can cut off. But we want to have the type of love that David is showing here for God, acknowledging and knowing that God is his source and God is his supply. It says here in verse 2 that the Lord is my rock. And when you think about a rock, you think about something hard. You think about something impenetrable. You think about something that's able to overcome, and that's the type of God we serve. God is a rock. See, my, my wife uses a term sometimes when she's dealing with some girlfriends that are just associates and not friends. We know there's a difference between an associate and a friend. 
And sometimes she says that some of her associates, she uses the term sometimey. And I said, well, what's sometimey? I asked her before, well, well, sometimes they're cool with you and sometimes they're not. But how many of you know with God, he ain't like that because God is a rock. A rock is hard. A rock is impenetrable. A rock is somebody that'll stay with you when you got money and stay with you when you're broke. A rock is somebody that'll be with you not only when you're happy, but be with you when you don't feel so well. A rock is somebody that when things are going chaotic in your life, they don't move from their position of being your friend. They don't move when you have to ask them for something that, my God, that they wouldn't normally give. But a rock is somebody that you can stand upon and depend upon. And how many of you know that even though you may have a friend, Friend that may exude all those types of qualities of being a rock, that friend is not God. See, God differentiates himself from other men and other women because God is always going to make sure that his place in your life is going to be number one. That friend that may be your mother or father or brother or sister, at some point in time, they may let you down. But how many of you know that despite what you go through, God will never let you down? No, he won't. He won't let you down. See, you might not be able to get in front of that friend when it's two or three in the morning. You may be able to, you may be going through some things. You may, your wife might be laying by your side. You may shake her, honey, I need to talk to you. Oh, honey, it's just important. Talk to me tomorrow. You know, but God, in the wee hours of the morning time, late night, you can still cry out to God. And God will not only hear your prayer, but God will deliver you in the time of need because my God is a rock. I don't know if you understand it. A rock is hard. My God is hard. We don't serve a weak God. And see, some people have the misconception that being a Christian is weak. But being a Christian is not weak. Uh, Being a Christian is a point of strength because there's a word that says meekness. And see, meekness, you have to understand, meek don't mean weak. Meekness means that mm, when I'm going through a situation, when things are hard, I have the strength to reserve myself. I have the power to overcome, but I'm not going to exercise it. Oh, my God, Jesus was meek when he went upon that cross. He could have called legions of angels down to get him off of that cross, but he exuded meekness. Because meekness is when you have the power to say something or do something about your situation, but you choose not to access it. Meekness is also a fruit of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. So what that means is when the Holy Spirit resides in you, he gives you the fruit of the Spirit, which is meekness. And meekness is when somebody says something against you and you get mad and and part of you is saying, I should say this, that, or the other. Meekness will creep in and say, no, just hold your peace. Oh, sometimes when we're dealing with our loved ones, sometimes we got to learn how to bridle that tongue and to hold our peace. Some, you know the old saying, you know, you better look before you leap. Sometimes we better be quick to hear and slow to speak because sometimes your mouth can get you in trouble with some things. Oh, how many, oh, thank you, Jesus. How many times have you said something and then you wish you could have took it back? Oh, you said something hurtful. You said something below the belt and you wish you could take it back. My wife used to say, take it back, take it back. But I found out something. After you said something, you can't take it back. I didn't put something out there. I didn't say something about you. I've said something below the belt. How am I going to take it back when I already delivered it through my lips? It spurred from in the inside of me. It came out my mouth. I uttered it, and it hurt you. I can't take it back once it's dispatched. So I got to learn how to step on that thing on the front end. And when it bubbles up, and when I think about saying it, that's when God needs to intervene and say, brother, hold your peace. And sometimes when you get in a confrontation with somebody, you have to, instead of confronting and say, you know what, it's not a good time for me to talk right now because if we continue in that conversation, I may say something or do something that's contrary to what I'm trying to do. Amen. So we have to allow God to be the director of our spirit. We have to allow God to be the one through the Holy Spirit to bridle our tongue because God is a rock. God is somebody that you can depend on, church. You don't have to worry about looking to the right or looking to the left because God never departs you. He's always right there. And when you think about a rock, not only do you think about being hard, but you think about it being a foundation. The Lord is a foundation. He's a solid foundation. If you think about your house, your house is built upon a foundation, and you don't know how strong that house is until the storm comes. 